let us join together in our call to worship. Come, let us worship God who gives us light to see the way. Come, let us worship God who gives us hope to walk in faith. Come, let us worship God who came as a child to save us. Come, let us worship God. Pray with us. O oh God, God, our, our light, light. If, if ever, ever there, there were, were a people who need your light, it, it is us. us. If, if ever, ever there, there were a place where hope, hope needed to be born, born it is in the manger of our hearts. The work of your hands surrounds us. The miracle of your coming confronts us. God of hope, come. Be present in our worship. Be present in our lives, now and always. Amen. Yes, Lord, come and be present with us this day. Come. And remind us that because of Christ's first advent, because of his sacrifice, his death and his resurrection, because of Christ, we have the forgiveness of sin and the cleansing of all unrighteousness. Come and remind us that we are your people, holy and acceptable in your sight. Come and be with us in the name of Christ. Amen. What is hope? Modern culture tells us it is a maybe, a kind of unsure optimism, but in scripture, hope is an indication of certainty. Hope means a strong and confident expectation. The Israelites were hoping for a savior, their Messiah. God had promised a Messiah and they believed it. They didn't know when or who, but they were waiting. Zechariah was a Levite in the nation of Israel. He worked in the temple and was a God-fearing man. He and his wife Elizabeth were childless in a culture where children were considered to be a sign of God's blessing. Zechariah had prayed and prayed to God, asking for a child, but God had not sent one. As Zechariah stood in the Holy of Holies that day, preparing to offer the sacrifices for the people, an angel appeared to him with a message from God. Fear not, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You are to name him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will be rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord his God. He is never to take wine or ferment a drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will bring back to the Lord our God, and he will go before the Lord to make ready a people. But when Zechariah heard Gabriel's words, his first reaction was not hope, it was doubt. He asked the angel, but how can this be? I am an old man, the angel responded. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I will be sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Elizabeth did become pregnant, and Zachariah found himself wholeheartedly living in hope, in confident expectation that God would give him a son and that Messiah was soon to follow. Today, we too can live with Zachariah's hope. We can live with the certainty and the confident expectation that Christ not only came to this world as a baby so long ago, but he will return and everything that God has promised will come true. What hope? Dear Jesus, we start this Advent season waiting for you, like the Israelites who worldly long, hoping against hope that you would bring your promised Messiah. We desperately wait for you to fill our hearts with our glorious presence this Advent season. 
please allow us to see the beauty and refining that comes when we cease our striving and choose to boldly trust that your promises will come true. Thank you, Mike and Linda. CBS this morning told the story of two commercial fishermen, John Aldridge and Anthony Sosinski. They set out one day from Montauk, New England, or Long Island to go fishing. About 40 miles offshore, Anthony was sleeping down below while on deck, John was starting to get things ready for the catch that they hoped to haul in. John was pulling on a handle with all his might when it snapped, sending him sprawling backwards and off the boat. With the boat on autopilot, it just kept cruising right along. As soon as John surfaced from under the water, he began screaming at the top of his lungs. But there was no way that Anthony would ever hear him. And he didn't. John watched as the boat went over the top top of a crest, the crest of a wave and out of sight. He was alone, treading water in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Without a life vest, John thought that he was going to die. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? If ever there was a hopeless situation, that was it. Or was it? While John was trying to calm down, trying to quiet his thoughts of certain death, trying just to stay afloat, John realized that his boots were buoyant. John got an idea. He took one of his boots off, emptied it of water, and thrust it down into the water, trapping the air into it. And it floated. So John stuck his boots under his armpits. And they worked as a flotation device. At least he could stay afloat. Ah, a ray of hope. John thought of his family and the fact that no one even knew he was missing, except the two sharks that were swimming about 15 feet away. But fortunately, they didn't even seem to care. John began to set some goals, beginning with the goal of just trying to stay alive until morning. Four hours later, Anthony woke up and realized that John was missing. The first thing he did was to call the Coast Guard, who immediately began search procedures, even though the commander admitted that the prospects of finding John really were impossible given the fact that there was so much open water. On the boat, John found the broken handle and knew what John must have been doing when he went overboard, which also meant Anthony realized how deep the water would have been. Well, John survived until morning, trying to keep 
hope alive. But the hours kept passing with no sign of help. Finally, John spotted a boy and he was able to reach it and climb aboard. This brought a new ray of hope. After an hour, there was a Coast Guard helicopter that flew over and spotted jo um, John waving and splashing down below. After pulling him aboard, the rescue diver told John, we've been searching you for you for nine hours. <laughs> well, I've been looking for you for 15 hours. Miraculously, John Aldridge survived. What an amazing story. What amazing hope. If it had been most of us out there in the middle of the ocean, most of us probably would have given up hope that there had been no chance, not even a sliver of a chance to survive. But hope is like that. Hope, hope is the whisper that maybe, just maybe those boots will float. Maybe, just maybe those boots will keep us afloat. What, what is hope in your life? What hope keeps you afloat? For some, for some, it, hope is the first candle that is lit when the power goes off after the direct show. For some, hope is the first day when you wake up and you can breathe after pneumonia. For some, hope is that percentage that you have that you're going to beat COVID. For some, hope is that first ray of sunshine that peeks in through the window. For some, hope, hope is the ray of sunshine that comes after a dark, dark, difficult night. For some, hope is the first soldier that lands on the beachhead. For some, hope is hearing the words, it's going to be okay. You're going to make it. For some, hope is the flicker of maybe. Just, just maybe. For some, hope is the fuel of faith. For all of us, hope is what we celebrate during the season of Advent. Because you see, Advent is the season of hope. Advent, Advent literally means coming or arrival. And this Advent season is marked by expectation, anticipation, waiting, longing. Yeah, see, Advent isn't just an extension of the season of Christmas. Advent is a season that links the past and the present and the future. Advent gives us an opportunity to share the ancient longing for the coming of the Messiah 
with the celebration of his birth and the expectation for his second coming. Advent, Advent is not just the celebration that God is coming to fix things. Advent is the celebration of God coming. God coming to be with us. See, because he is God with us in the darkness, in the pain, in the chaos, God comes. God with us. See, because that's the way that God has been working throughout history. In the beginning, that was the way God intended it to be. In the beginning, God came. In the beginning, God was with us. In the beginning, God came and God was with us. God came and God was with Adam and Eve. He walked with them. He related with them. He fellowshiped with them. But you know the story. Adam and Eve chose sin. And because of sin, that relationship, that fellowship, that walk was broken. And the brokenness of our world, the brokenness of our lives resulted. But do you know that ever since God has been working towards restoration, towards healing, towards wholeness? That's the story of the Bible. And throughout it all, we see that God is making a way. And God is reminding us that there is hope. But much time has passed, hasn't there? Years and generations and centuries. And we are an im patient people. How long, oh God? That was the cry of the Israelites from the times of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to David, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the prophets. There was a repeating history of devotion to God and then neglect of God. There was prosperity, and then poverty, feast, and famine, pleasure, and pain. You know, the, the Hebrews weren't any different than us. When things were good, they forgot God. When things were bad, they cried out to God. But through it all, there was, there was a deep longing, a deep longing for God to fulfill his promise, a deep longing for Messiah, a deep longing for the Savior, a deep longing for God with us, for God to come, for God to come and make everything right. That was their deep hope. That's our deep hope. The deep hope that sustained them, a deep hope that sustains us, that encourages them and encourages us, especially in the midst of our waiting, in the midst of our journey, in the midst of their journey. Isaiah was the poster prophet of hope, the poster prophet of Advent. 
the season of longing, the season of expectation, the season of hoping for God with us. And through Isaiah, God gave Israel and us many prophecies and promises about the Messiah that would come. Isaiah was and is a voice of hope. You, you know Isaiah's prophecies, prophecies that are very popular this time of year. Listen, listen to some of what Isaiah wrote. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Nevertheless, we'll, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On the living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. A little later in the same chapter, Isaiah wrote, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Can you imagine living in that ancient land and hearing a message like that? Can you imagine the hope that would spring in the people's hearts? Did Isaiah understand those words, those prophecies? I think on some level, probably, but on other levels, not at all. He didn't know God's timeline for when and how God would fulfill those words. But Isaiah was filled with hope. God's prophecies fueled him and fueled his people to continue with hope. And those words should fuel us with hope, even today. Do you have hope? No matter what kinds of problems and struggles that we are facing today, no matter what kind of season of darkness and despair we are in, don't abandon hope. Just like John Aldridge never abandoned hope. Hope is still alive, even in our darkest despair, even in the most hopeless circumstance. Hope is alive because God is with us. How do we know? How can we find that slightest sliver of hope, even when we're on the verge of giving up? I think there are several ways that we can keep hope alive. And the first is based on God's word. Because God's word is God with us. God's word is God's promises to us. It's, it's a piece of him left for us. And they're beacons of hope. They're reminders that can penetrate our heart and keep us going no matter what we're facing, no matter what our circumstances. No matter how bleak 
our circumstances might be. No matter how bad the pain, God's word is a reminder that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Remind yourself of these words from Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day for darkness is as light to you. There's hope in those words because you are not alone. God with us means that he will always be with us. Nothing, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Scripture is filled with stories and words and promises that will rekindle the hope within us. As we move through Advent, I encourage you, dig in to the word of God because God is with us. The second thing that will rekindle our hope is the character of God, who he is, what he is. There's a story in Mark chapter five that sometimes we overlook. It's a story about a woman. We don't even know her name, but for 12 years, this woman has been dealing with bleeding. No one has been able to help her. In fact, as she has sought help, it's only made matters worse. She has spent her entire life savings, but it's only made things worse. This issue is blood has affected everything about her life, every day of her life. Any of you that has had a long-term illness, you can relate to her. This woman, because of her bleeding, is considered unclean. She's treated like an outcast. But she's heard about Jesus. She's heard the stories. She's heard about the miracles, about the healings. And she believes. And it awakens a sense of hope, hope of healing, hope of a new life. And she's driven to take action. If I can just get close to him, if I can just get close enough to reach out and even just touch the hem of his clothing, if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. If Jesus is who he says he is, who he claims to be, he can heal me. It was a bold hope, but she held on to it. And so she did everything that she had to do just to get close enough, close enough to reach out and touch him. And what she did made all the difference in the world. Was it hard? Oh, it had to be. I mean, making her way through that huge crowd, and especially because she was stigmatized. She was looked down upon. She was an outcast. Was she afraid? Undoubtedly. But she reached out. And she touched. Who touched me? (gasps) What do you mean, who touched you, the disciples said? Do you see the size of this crowd? The woman, the woman must have 
froze in place. On the one hand, she knew that she had miraculously been healed. On the other hand, she was scared to death. Uh, I, 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 I touched you, sir. But Jesus, Jesus was moved by her faith. He was God with us. And in that moment, he healed her even more amazingly because not only did he give her physical healing, he gave her emotional healing, mental healing, spiritual healing. And he completely changed her life because that's our God. That's his character, his nature, his very being. He was and he still is God with us. He was her hope and he is our hope. And when he came that first Christmas, he fulfilled every hope. And when he rose from the dead that first Easter, he fulfilled our hope. And he is still our hope. And when he comes again on that second advent, he will completely fulfill our hope for all eternity. Because God is true to his character, because he is who he claims he is, and he is our hope. And we can find and choose hope by focusing on his faithfulness. How has he worked in your life? We just celebrated Thanksgiving. You know, I, I, I think of Charles Dickens, and Charles Dickens encouraged us to have a Thanksgiving Day switch. Instead of having one day of giving thanks and 364 days of grumbling, he said we should have one day of grumbling and 364 days of giving thanks. There's a lot of validity to that. But Thanksgiving, gratitude brings hope. Thanksgiving fosters hope, acknowledgement, and appreciation brings hope. Listen to these words from Jeremiah found in the book of Lamentations. Most of us don't read a book of grief, a book of Lamentations. But in Lamentations chapter 3, we read these words. Yet this I call to mind. And therefore, I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God is good to those who hope in him to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Did you catch those first words? Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. See, Jeremiah understood there is hope in the future when we remember what God has done in the past. Hope sparks like a fire. Hope flows like water. Hope grows like a seed. Hope grows and spreads like a living thing. Hope can dwindle and wane. And yes, hope can even die. But with nurture and care, hope can revive and flourish and multiply. Focusing on gratitude, counting our blessings can renew and grow our hope, recognizing 
and appreciating the good that God has shown us in the past increases our hope for all that he will do in our future. Sharing this gratitude with hope with those who love and support us will multiply its effort. John Aldridge had hope and it kept him alive. Advent is all about hope and it will keep us alive. We have hope no matter how dark our days, no matter how dire our circumstances, because God is with us, our Father and our God. We pray that you would rekindle our hope because of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our, our Father, Father, which art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a sign and seal of eating and drinking in communion with the crucified and risen Lord. During his earthly ministry, Jesus shared meals with his followers as a sign of community and acceptance, and as an occasion for his own ministry. The invitation to the Lord's Supper is extended to all who have been baptized, remembering that access to the table is not a right conferred upon the worthy, but a privilege given to the undeserving who come in faith, repentance, and love. In preparing to receive Christ in this sacrament, the believer is to confess sin and brokenness, to seek reconciliation with God and neighbor, and to trust in Jesus Christ for cleansing and renewal. Even one who doubts, whose trust is wavering, may come to the table in order to be assured of God's love and grace. Today we remember the way that Jesus showed us his love. In the last meal before his death, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Jesus said to them, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. And after giving thanks to God, he passed it around. Jesus said to them, drink this, all of you. This is my blood and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, every time we eat bread like this, and every time we drink wine like this, we remember Jesus and his everlasting love. Our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. <laughs> You <laughs> would come out here. Hey, 
Yeah. <laughs>